So let's talk now about magnetostatic energy. Magnetostatic energy is simply going to remind us of the fact that uh, magnetic fields are going to store energy and therefore inductors, which is the engine that turns currents into magnetic fields, will also store energy. Now we knew this concept from earlier that inductors store energy, but we're now going to redefine it. That the energy is not really stored in the inductor, it's stored by the magnetic fields that are created by the inductor. Now let's uh, take a closer look at that. Um, we had, uh, let, let's start by contrasting this to a capacitor. We had this idea that for a capacitor, one half times CV squared is the energy stored in a capacitor. And that had units of joules. Uh, the equivalent for inductors will be one half, and instead of a C, we're going to have an L for inductance, and instead of a V, we're going to have an I for current, and that's going to be the energy stored by an inductor. Also in units of joules. Now, earlier on, when we were talking about electric fields and capacitances, uh, we took the simple example of a parallel plate capacitor, from which you could determine that if you take, if you calculate its capacitance and you calculate the electric field um, between the two plates and you apply one half CV squared, you can also determine that the energy density stored in electric fields is one half times uh, epsilon, the permittivity, times the intensity of the electric field squared. This is the energy density in electric fields, and that's in units of joules per meter cubed. There's an equivalent example, and this is in the notes. Um, and the example given is if you have a coaxial cable that has current running through it, and you can calculate the magnetic fields inside the coaxial cable. You can also calculate the total energy stored uh, by that one meter length coaxial cable. And using that, you can relate the energy stored in the magnetic fields to the total energy stored in the inductor. And it works out to be the following, that one half times the mu, the permeability times the intensity of the magnetic field squared is the energy density in the magnetic field, also in units of joules per meter cubed, right? So this is a, an important and insightful um, result that when we talk about inductors, the energy is not stored in the current. It's not stored by the fact that the current is, is spinning around. What's actually happening is that the current is creating magnetic fields by virtue of that steady current, and those magnetic fields are storing energy. Um, and you can release that energy anytime you want, but that's stored in the magnetic fields, and that's what it takes to build up the current, is you have to sort of inject some amount of energy in order to build up those magnetic field lines. So inductors are really make, are really electromagnetic devices. They are not current devices. They are truly uh, magnetic phenomena that uh, um, involve the, um, uh, the magnetic field. All right, there's a little more in the notes about a comparison between inductance and capacitance, so you can see that. Um, I've talked some about it. For example, that uh, Q equals CV is kind of analogous to phi, the magnetic flux density equals L times I, but there's sort of a laundry list of these um, inductor capacitor um, uh, analogies that you can find in the notes. There's, a, there's a, a page that has capacitors on one side and inductors on the other, so you can see how they relate to each other. All right. One thing I wanna emphasize is now that we've got this result, this uh, one half CV squared and one half LI squared as being the inductance and capacitance that's stored, um, sorry, the energy that's stored in an inductor and a capacitor, let's relate this back to transmission lines, right? Because we know that um, Z zero equals the square root of L over C, which also means, uh, also that Z zero equals the voltage divided by the current. And so let's take, for example, you know, one half CV squared. And let's just try to make a couple substitutions in here, All right? So we can rearrange this into the following form. 
that C equals L over Z zero squared. So let's substitute that in. This will be one half times L over Z zero squared times V squared. We also know that Z zero equals V over I. So we can write this as one half times L over V over I squared times V squared. And we've got V squareds that are going to cancel. And this I squared here in the denominator is gonna, it's gonna pop up to the numerator. So this works out to one half times L I squared. All right, notice we started out with the energy that's stored in a capacitor. And we simply use our definition of transmission line impedance. And with that, we were able to directly determine the energy that's stored in the inductor. And what's amazing, what this tells us is that they're equal, right? It's actually an incredible insight about the notion of what um, the, the transmission line was doing, right? When we think about the transmission line as being this series of inductors and capacitors in order, that basically there is an energy transfer occurring back and forth. First, we are storing energy in the capacitor. And that stored energy is then jumping and the same amount of energy is stored in, in the inductor. And that same amount of energy then charged of the capacitor and vice versa. That should make sense. There's no, there's no reason to expect an imbalance. Um, there's no reason to expect that we'd have twice as much energy stored in the capacitor as the, as the inductor, right? There's sort of an equal motion of energy that has to happen if we're talking about power flow as being a transfer of an even amount of energy. And we've got to be roughly, we've got to be balancing it evenly between the inductance and capacitance. So actually this idea of a transmission line impedance being square root of L over C is a direct result of the condition that we have equal amounts of storage of energy in inductors and capacitors. And you can think of this in terms of one half L I squared and one half CV squared, right? That the voltage tells you something about the stored energy, but really it's not the voltage itself, but it's actually the electric and magnetic fields that are stored by uh, capacitors and inductors respectively that makes this work. And we're gonna see this again because the same concept of a wave on a transmission line as being a passing of the torch of energy from inductor to capacitor, capacitor back to inductor, inductor back to capacitor again, and moving on, we're going to see the exact same thing happen with the radio wave, except since we don't have voltages and currents in free space, we're going to have electric fields and magnetic fields. So we're gonna have the same phenomenon with radio waves, and we're just starting to see the beginnings of this, that one half mu times the uh, absolute value of the magnetic field squared is going to give us an equivalent amount of energy, one half epsilon E squared. So we're going to create a wave and in this radio wave, magnetic fields are going to store energy and that energy will then be converted over to electric fields which store the same amount of energy and that electric field will then turn it around and store the same amount of energy back in magnetic fields and the process will repeat. It's the same as for transmission lines. The only difference is we're using electric fields and magnetic fields instead of voltages and currents. So we're starting to see now the, the building blocks come together to take our, our vision and our understanding of transmission lines and map them into radio waves and wireless communications and radars and all kinds of systems that rely on electromagnetic waves. But in order to get there, um, we have to be able to change things in time. And in the coming sections, we're going to complete the most important pieces, which is things that vary in time. Since we can't have a wave, we can't have information flow without having some kind of change in time. And in the next section, we're going to break away from statics. We're going to break away from the notion of um, things that don't change in time. And we're going to start to introduce time variations, building us up toward that uh, pinnacle result of understanding the radio wave and how it works.